I'm really excited about today's show, not only because of the topic, but who I get to share the camera with. Today, our topic is about bonding and attachment, which is the foundation of all human relationships. But not only is bonding and attachment about relationships, it's also about the primary relationship we have with ourself. Because it is through bonding and healthy attachments that we develop our fundamental sense of our self and self-safety as well. The capacity to have healthy affect regulation is developed very early in life. Uh, some theorists think it's in utero. We know that an infant's ability to handle stressful changes in the external environment is developed by being exposed to regulation of the infant's shifting arousal levels. Bonding is binary. It either happens or it doesn't. And when bonding and attachment is interrupted or broken, emotional attachment is insecure and an unstable self-system develops, resulting in poor capacity to regulate affect and emotion. Now, as therapists we in the consulting room, we are often confronted with children, adolescents, and adults who neither show any affect or they display inappropriate affect in social situations. Many, if not most individuals suffering with addictions, borderline personality disorder, and many compulsive disorders also suffer from broken or interrupted bonding and attachment-related developmental events. That's what our show is about today. And to help me navigate these tough waters is my friend and sometime guest, Sophia Amargi, psychotherapist and lecturer. And she has a lot to say on this topic. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my, my friend and, and my guest today to talk about bonding and attachment, Ms. Sophia Amargi, psychotherapist, lecturer, and all around very smart lady. Sophia, so glad to have you on our show today. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're going to have a, a rollicking show today. You know, you, Sophia's prepared uh, some questions that, uh, uh, that really kind of tap what bonding and attachment is. So without further ado, I want to get into uh, what bonding and attachment is. Sophia, uh, you know deeply uh, how bonding and attachment affects individuals. How would you like to start this today? And I think we should start pr probably with the fundamentals of what bonding and attachment are. Well, actually, if we can even go before that, uh -huh. I, when you and I were talking about doing another show together, right. and you asked me, what did I want to talk about? What was of interest right now? And I told you this story, which is what led us into our topic for today. Right. And so I want to talk about this because I'm often walking on the beach and I see all kinds of things happen, lots of parent-child interactions going on. And what I've started to notice quite consistently is, and I just saw this the other day, I saw a small child walking slightly behind his father on the beach and his father was on his cell phone. And this broke my heart. And the child was trying to jump in the waves and noticing shells. And the dad was walking maybe 10 feet ahead on the cell phone. And I felt so deeply sad for this child and also for the lost opportunity for the parent. Mm -hmm. I see this all the time. I was recently traveling to the East Coast and back. And I saw children in the airport, babies not even a year old, mm -hmm. being put in front of a parent's cell phone to watch cartoons when the two parents are talking to each other. So this has got me riled up. It's and the that's why I want to talk about Absolutely. It. And it's the 21st century pacifier, isn't it? It is what I see it all the time in restaurants, on the plane, wherever I am. Parents, when a kid, when a child, an infant starts to show movement, the parent uh, slaps a, a digital, uh, you know, a device in front of them to, to quiet them down. Then they get stimulated. And that stimulation and, and all of that takes the, the kid's attention, speeds up their brain, but we're going to get to that yes, in a little yes, bit. Yes, yes, so, We have a lot to talk about, yeah, about we do, that. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So, so it's this issue of the digital world affecting 
parent-child relationships, affecting bonding and, and attachment. The ch child becomes more now attached to the digital object, the phone, the, the iPad, the whatever it is, the tablet, versus the, a human interaction or a human, the parent. Well, the parent is supposed to provide the secure base for the child to, <clears throat> excuse me, navigate the world. Right. And so without that secure base, the child is beginning to experience the world quite differently than, let's say, 50 years ago. So not having a secure base from which to navigate the world actually prevents the child from developing effective and healthy relationships with other people throughout the course of its life. This bonding, right. infant bonding, zero to five bonding, right. in utero bonding even, right. this affects the child's ability to successfully navigate life. And this in utero bonding is very interesting because oftentimes we see, uh, maybe on television or in the movies, uh, a, a, a mom playing music right mm. and then having the music close to the baby the baby sen senses th that those sounds or, or or those vibrations if you will mm -hmm. and that's part of the bonding in utero mm -hmm. so the baby in utero becomes attached to the mother because of of the uh, relationship uh, of warmth and comfort and also healthy quiet vibrations that's true. I think that the um, right hemisphere of the brain starts to differentiate in the last trimester of pregnancy. Right. And so when we're looking at infant-child bonding, right. especially infant bonding, right. there has to be right brain to right brain uh, communication. Absolutely. So that's where the child and the mother start to connect. The mother is supposed to be attuned to whatever the child is presenting with and right. then provide comfort and soothing, oftentimes with physical touch. Right. But if a child is put in front of a device right. or if the parent is, let's say, angry mm -hmm. and uh, kind of ascribes incorrect notions to this child, like this child is crying to test me, <coughs> this child is working my last nerve, doing this you know, <coughs> on purpose, something like that then if the parent is angry, punishing, ascribing incorrect notions about what the child is doing and why, then we start to see children <coughs> that uh, don't present with healthy affect, they don't present with the appropriate emotional response to their environment. They start to act as if they're not feeling what they're feeling, simply in order to remain in close proximity to their primary caregiver. and physical touch, tactile soothing, close proximity, right brain to right brain communication is key to healthy brain development and affect or emotional regulation. In, in, in line with you know, my orientation of making it functional. What's it? Making what it functional? The issue of bonding. Okay, making bonding functional? What do we want to tell people? It's kind of like the how-to. How-to? how to become successfully bonded with your child. Let's see, there's because so many Because it happens things. immediately. Yes, well. Or it doesn't. Well, when a mother is given an infant, a brand new baby, healthy attachment begins, as you say, in utero, right. especially in the last trimester, but specifically eye to eye gazing. Exactly. And mommy says, I love you, I love you, you're the prettiest baby, you're right. the smartest baby, mommy loves you. And literally, information <laughs> is transmitted through the eye gaze, through the ocular receptors, into the actual system of the child. Here's what's really interesting. Let me let me interrupt for yes. one second. I, a, a number of years ago, I attended an international symposium on uh, attachment and attachment disorders and bonding. And we saw films in England mm. of a mother and, a, and an infant <clears throat> sitting across from each other. And when the bonding was occurring, it was like, it was like this mm -hmm. between the mom and the child. Mm -hmm. But when it wasn't occurring, the child would this and the mother would this, mm -hmm. and you knew immediately that it wasn't happening. So. Again, this what you're saying is so important. It's correct. It is that gaze. It is that connection that also releases uh, 
oxytocin, oxytocin in our the brain. Our favorite bonding our agent. Our favorite, favorite drug. And it warms our us. Our biology well, drug. But it, but it warms us up. Well, it's bonding. That's the bonding drug. And, and we can all, we always know when oxytocin is present because we, in, in the presence of another, when it's happening, it doesn't necessarily have to be between a parent and a child. It can be between friends. Uh, it doesn't matter. That warmth that you feel that connection? Well, it only takes 17 seconds of skin-to-skin -skin contact for the brain to start to produce oxytocin. Right. And oxytocin, <clears throat> being a bonding agent, right. is also a calming agent. Absolutely. It calms the nervous system. Right. So this tactile reassurance is critical right. to self-regulation. Right. And if the mother is not touching, eye-gazing, right. soothing, being physically present, right. We have a child that starts to be unable to regulate itself. And then the child starts to make a bunch of unconscious stories that it's somehow not okay mm -hmm. for having these feelings because they're not being attuned to. They're not being properly right. cared for. And apropos to what you said about the mom mm -hmm. cradling the baby. Mm -hmm. Now let's just take a different scenario. M mom drops the baby. Yikes. Not physically necessarily but metaphorically. Well, that's better. I like that better. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Metaphorically, mom drops the baby. Mom is not there. Mom is not providing that warmth, that touch, that mm -hmm. sensate pleasure to the baby. The baby then just automatically senses that they're not safe. Well, that's the critical piece, right? So all so, of that s safety as a platform for launching into life itself. That's right. So the safety and connection and consistency, you and I are always coming back to consistency. It is thematic in all healthy development, <clears throat> consistent response on the part of the parent, consistent touch, consistent attunement. When it is inconsistent, right. we have a child whose system is inconsistent. It right. develops that way. That's right. In the emotional system, in the limbic system especially, fight, flight, freeze, or fold, develops the, the concept, the idea, very primordial, very primitive, I'm not safe. Mm -hmm. And it is that not safe, and, and we're going to be touching on this, I think, throughout our talk today. It is that I'm not safe that develops later life in I'm not safe anywhere. And then it's like, they don't like me, I don't like myself. But I think I'm getting ahead of the game. Well, but that the safety is kind of everything. This can become complex, let's say, for people to begin to understand. But if we can really back and break it down, we're actually looking at very, very basic concepts of safe, not safe. Right. Very good, basic. Good, not good. Right. Is I'm good, like I'm good with myself right. because whatever the emotion that I'm experiencing, right. mommy's there, mommy loves me, mommy loves me, mommy loves me, mm -hmm. it's okay, I'm safe, I'm good with myself and right. in the world. Mm -hmm. And then this very basic concept, if mommy's not there, if mommy is ascribing sort of crazy notions to what the baby's doing and why, if mommy's angry, if mommy's addicted, if mommy's harried, harassed, if mommy's you know busy with no time at all. Mommy is out of touch. Completely out of touch, then the baby cannot regulate and it begins as That's you right. just said. You know, there's something wrong with me, I'm not okay, I'm not entitled to these emotions. Right. And then interpersonal interaction starts to become skewed. Right. If it isn't set, if that early template in neural wiring is not set <clears throat> zero to five, right. then it doesn't get set. And this is where you and I come in in the work that we're doing now, which is to try to help people rewire right. and groove new neural patterns so that attachment can become safe and not activating. Right. But if an individual is not soothed and safe and connected right. consistently in childhood, then if that is not repaired, and the repair is critical, and that's part of what you and I are doing now in our work with these this clients, is, is what, we're, re, we're literally repairing a breach. We're trying to. We are trying to. And it takes to. a lot of work because it all comes back to the self-system. Mm -hmm. How I feel about myself, who I think I am, and how I relate to other people. So if we talk about borderline clients, for example. Correct. A key component of a borderline client is the inability to self-regulate. And if they're not able to self-regulate, they cannot self-reflect. So there's no internal <clears throat> mirror. So this is an individual right. who is empty because mommy or the secure right. object did not fill them up. 
So right. then this is a person who uses whatever external feedback they're getting from the world as the regulator. I'm good, I'm desirable, right. no one's noticing me, I'm not good, I'm no right. longer desirable. And also that affects, uh, their, in terms of their relationships, approach avoidance type. And I also use this, put your hand up. Yeah, and push. And, and so th this is what borderline feels like when you're treating it. It's that push-pull, it's like that. And it's never just kind of congruent. There's always resistance. Always. Always. In everything. Exactly. Yeah, I try not to work with too many borderline clients these days I because work it's with very, a lot. it's yeah. exhausting. I work with a lot of borderlines. Because I it's testing, testing, <clears throat> testing, and the right. testing, right. and a lot of that sort of dysregulated behavior yeah. is all about establishing safety in the world. Well, that's, you know, it's the work that I do with my relation-based, compassion-focused therapy is, is, is kind of reintegrating what a healthy relationship can be, and they get to test it out in the office. Well, I, I do that too, Yeah. but <clears throat> the borderline projection mm -hmm. is that tendency to lay onto whoever the therapist is, whoever's trying to help them, whoever the lover, the husband, all the best stuff. friend, the projection is oh, yeah. just, you know, it's like an avalanche right. of all of their, let's say, disowned parts. Absolutely. And, the, you know, as Jung calls that the shadow, all the right. parts that people think make them unlovable. Right. The projection of that onto the helpful therapist right. can just feel like an avalanche. And it can be tough to navigate. Right. So and I've done quite a bit of that. You but. know, Jung calls that the shadow, but mm -hmm. I call it living the life that they're living is a shadow self. It's a shadow of it's their so of what could be who they are internally that they never really get a chance to feel. They don't get a chance to, to experience who they really could be or what's, what's down there. All of those treasures, they never get a chance to experience right. I always that. say that it's like one-dimensional living. That's right. Well, right. They're not I, fully inhabiting they themselves. Can't. They They're can't. empty. There's an emptiness. Well, everything they do is about security mm -hmm. and being feeling safe. Mm -hmm. Everything. That's sad. Yeah, it's very sad. It's so sad. It's long work with borderlines. So, Do you know that borderlines and anorexics are the most difficult to treat and cure? Yeah, I know. I treat them. Yeah. <laughs> I do too. Yeah, and they all, I don't treat have... any anorexics yeah. these days, though. Yeah, yeah. I, do, I used to do a lot of borderlines. And most of our anorexics them. are girls, right? Right. And they all have daddy issues. They do? Yep, they all have... Mother but, wound and father wound. Absolutely, but we don't want to get too far okay. afield in that one. Okay. Uh, so the role of attachment in the neurobiology and healthy brain functioning, which we're touching on, mm -hmm. is there anything more you want to add to that? Because I think this is well, critical. This is a critical factor here, in terms of how the brain develops. Yes. So, so the emotional regulation parts of the brain, right. which you probably know more than I do, the amygdala, the yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. all this it's stuff. It's the whole limbic system. Yes. And the uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So if we have a child, who is not helped by their parent to regulate, who is not in close proximity, right. who is always being put in front of a tablet or an iPhone or whatever it might be, <clears throat> right. we start to watch an individual lose the capacity for creative thinking and problem solving. Right. And so what we also begin to see is we start to see children with, what, is there a reason these days that everybody's talking about ADD? Everybody's talking about ADD right. because they're getting information in fractions and fractals, and they're not staying with a consistent narrative. Here's an example. If you're deep sea diving, then you are submerged in an environment and taking information from it, mm -hmm. synthesizing it, and remaining, for the most part, single focused. Right. That's as if you were reading a book. But if you're jet skiing, then you're staying on top of the water, not going wow. in. Yeah. And you're only taking in bits and pieces of your environment as you're jet skiing by it. So we start to see neural development start to become extremely skewed. We see children who don't have the capacity to creatively think. We see children who don't have the capacity to accurately read their environment. We see children that um, have much uh, higher uh, frustration and a greater inability to focus for any real length of time in order to experience their environment. And, and, that, and that's really important, and, not to, and, and I want to add to that mm -hmm. a little piece. Now, so we talk about oxytocin, that, which we, we get from bonding, mm -hmm. but there's that <clears throat> within the limbic system, and especially uh, the basal ganglia, mm -hmm. is the dopamine Mm -hmm. area that, uh, you know, when dopamine is so important uh, in, in 
feeling good. It, it is like uh, it is like an opioid, if you will. And in fact, many uh, people take opioids because they're not getting the dopamine, or they take uh, uh, they take these opioids to get to, to release dopamine in their brain. So we have these dopamine releasers. What a waste! Because we don't get, apropos to what you're saying, kids don't get that internal experience of creativity. Like I, you know, I did growing up, you know, we didn't have money to buy stereos and all that. So you took a radio and you get a couple of cheap speakers. Now you got your stereo. That's creativity. It's going into the woods is creativity, right? Yeah, Playing right. in the garden is creativity. Absolutely. Playing with your toys, building stuff with your toys is creativity. Right. Right. You know, this world of imagination is where innovation comes from. Absolutely. And having an imagining of love and life with somebody else right. is part of what has to get set in childhood. Right. If you are used to these tiny little short fractalized bites of information or feelings, then one grows up to expect that from other people. So when we talk about neural development, we're actually looking at a change in this generation particularly of how young people are relating to each other. Right. So this kind of texting has a lot to do with the inability to actually show up and creatively engage right. with another mm -hmm. person. So you're hidden, mm -hmm. you risk nothing, mm -hmm. just like that um, child right. who will pretend that they don't have emotion mm -hmm. in order to not risk rejection from a rejecting or an angry mother. Right. We see young adults fearful of rejection hiding behind a screen, afraid to show up and be seen or see. There's no creativity of interpersonal interaction. This is how actually people learn and grow. Because it's all surface. Everything is You're, on the surface Everybody's now. jet skiing. And, and all that creativity and all that, that stimulus input is, is, is manufactured stuff. And, and actually, we're, we're manipulating how children experience the universe. Yeah, so that to me is a sin. And so I want to talk about this word sin, if I may just digress for a moment. Absolutely. So I use this word sin, S-I-N, often in my work with people. And I want to explain what that means to me and why I use it. In ancient archery, to shoot true and hit the target, this is your shooting true. But if you shoot a sin, you miss the target. And that's the context in which I use this word. I got it. So I feel like this is a sin because we are missing the target, which is to enhance the child's sense of itself, sense of its value, encourage its creative problem solving. So here's what we end up with. We end up with adults who have so much more frustration and so much less ability to problem solve. They have less ability to successfully and authentically or truly bond with another person. And when a parent is frustrated, it's like, uh, it's like a magnet. Who gets that frustration? The child. the child. And then how does the child learn to deal with their own frustrations? In other words, their ability to withstand, th their threshold becomes so much lower. Mm -hmm. So everything sends them off. So and I think this is a big, this is a reason why we have so much addiction today and so many other uh, problems. Lack of insight, lack of self-awareness, lack of understanding, lack of self-empathy, lack of self comp especially lack of self-compassion, which in my book is empathy and attunement. And, and kids don't have that. It's almost like they look inside, they see blank. So that actually, if we can go back to this notion of dopamine production. Go ahead. So if we're talking about full or empty, the effective production of dopamine right. is the feeling of feeling full. Correct. And I'm full with myself. Without enough dopamine or serotonin, I feel empty particularly with dopamine. And so you and I both do a lot of work in the field of addiction and recovery. That's correct. And like, what do we know that is true? Like what do all of clients share? They feel bad about themselves. They feel that there's something wrong with themselves. Right. They feel empty inside and they are seeking this fullness. Right. The key feature that I hear over and over is I'm not good enough. Always. Well, that's I'm the not cool word. good enough mm -hmm. that I am not perfect, 
because we're all perfectly imperfect and I think that is something that we have to understand. And I think when you don't feel good about yourself, that that sense of not being perfect becomes paramount. Well, or not being good enough becomes paramount. Look around you. Everyone you see shares a deep and terrible secret that no one ever talks about. It is, in fact, one of the best kept secrets of all time, as universal and natural as the air we breathe, and just as pervasive. No one is immune to it. Look inside yourself. We listen to it instinctively, hold it closely, impetuously, and follow it without question every moment of our lives. The secret is our inner voice. The self-talk, the primal and silent internal communication that form alongside our psyche, feeding us constant messages that control our behavior. We hear it, but we can never see or feel or detect it in any other way. If you'd like to learn more about the relationship of early life abuse, trauma, neglect, violence, and its relationship to addiction, please pick up a copy of my new book, The Science of Shame and Its Treatment, available at the bookstore or online. Thank you very much. It's almost like a cultural wound. We kind of have hit on this a little bit previously, but it has such relevance to attachment and bonding, which is, this is like a cultural wound. I'm not good enough, there must be something wrong with me, because the cultural expectations are unrealistic. And so if one is using that as a measurement, let's say a value, mm -hmm. you know, to look a certain way or weigh a certain amount or make a certain level of achievement, in which case that then is your barometer of success or failure, right. then this kind of idea of looking for something outside yourself, it keeps you on the hamster wheel always. You're never getting there, but you're always trying to run towards. And, and so, so it's, you're burning up a lot of time and a lot of energy. My two key concepts of life, time mm -hmm. and energy, mm -hmm. they go right out the window because we're, we're, we're just doing self-safety and we're not doing any learning, growing, experiencing, and that that would go into the neuro, neuro bank or the neurological bank that we can draw on in life. So I agree with you so completely. And if we can take that back to this little child that I saw on the beach, mm -hmm. it's very alive in me because mm -hmm. I recently saw it, but I'm holding on to it. I don't want to hold on to it particularly, but I'm holding on to it. This idea of a child having a creative and full experience of itself, mm -hmm. and no one's there to notice. I mean, we see children all the time. Right. Mom, mom, look at me, look at me. Mom, right. mom, watch mom, right. watch mom. And that mom is on the phone now or the dad is on the phone. And so the child is having an experience of itself, but unwitnessed, unvalidated, it's the mom is not seeing it, so the child can't feel it. This and is the I love you. Yeah, that's right. And I love you, right. I see you, you're beautiful, you're the best baby. Look at you, I love you, you're jumping in the waves, right. I'm so proud of you, it's so exciting. Then the child can take it in. That's the beginning of feeling full. But when the mom is not looking at the baby, the mom is literally dropping the baby, the baby develops, the child develops the concept, I'm not good enough. If I was good enough, mommy would pay attention, daddy would pay attention, people would pay attention to me, mm -hmm. but they don't. So how else is a child supposed to learn that they're okay, that they're safe, that they're, you know, there's a universe to protect them. We have all of these child law, these laws to protect children from abuse and neglect and, and all of that. They're but neglected the big, all the time. All the time. <laughs> we see it all the, all the time. time. Yeah. That is neglect that in is, both of our opinions. And I think it's abuse. I think it's and abuse I think it's too. A, and I think it's abuse when a mother doesn't take the time to say I love you and reinforce it and reinforce it because maybe the mom doesn't like herself and maybe that's something we have to look at because I think a lot of these issues are generational. They are, they are. This attachment wound gets transmitted intergenerationally. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it yeah. really does. Yeah. It's so interesting because uh, I hear from clients, especially clients struggling with addiction, 
that this idea like uh, I shouldn't get a big head or they can't accept a compliment or even when they're doing really well and I'm reflecting how well they're doing right. to themselves, uh. it doesn't go in at all. It's literally like there's no capacity to take in something that challenges their own internal narrative of empty, not okay, not enough, not right. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I am not good enough. Folks, yeah. this, is, this is beyond important. And I feel passionate just as you do about Absolutely. so many of these issues. Is this whole issue of I'm not good enough. It's a lie. It's, it's a, a lie. lie. It's a but, lie. It's based on it's based on lack, the lack of empathic attunement, right. the lack of connection, right. the lack of bonding, the lack of attachment, the lack of a secure base that the primary attachment figure is supposed to provide right. for the child to explore the world. Right. And if that stuff isn't in place right. and isn't consistent, we have a child, fast forward, I'm not good enough because my needs weren't met, there must be something wrong with me. Right, and what I see often in my work is that at 17 or 18, the child graduates high school. Now some that have, or many that have healthy attachment can launch, they can go off to college and all that. But those that don't, over and over, have what we call a failure to launch. That is a failure for independent living, a failure to go on to college. You know, in high school, they have to move you through until the age of 18. You have to have a diploma in most states, and especially uh, here. But, but when a child has a failure to launch, they don't. And then what happens is now they have to deal with themselves because nobody is pushing them through the system. Then what do they do? That's a really good question because actually I'm working with a client right now. I want you to answer it. <laughs> no, that's a failure to launch. Then what do they do? I don't know what they do. I guess they go to therapy. They go into therapy, they go to community college, if that, or they go into the military and they but try they to make it. They often go into drugs or alcohol. That's correct. That's actually what I see. Or that's drugs very... and alcohol are actually happening in high school because we know that high school is the incubator mm -hmm. for many addicts. Mm -hmm. And I see it in my work. I do too. You know, I've had kids coming in that are heroin addicted, cocaine addicted, pot, you can smell it in the bathrooms, yep. uh, that, that type of thing. And, oh, I and see it, that every day because I do a lot of work with people in right. struggling with addictions and you know really trying to get recovered. And of course, I work with a lot of undercover folks in, in, my, in my other life is you know, doing police psychology and, 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 and working with folks that are they're plants. They're plants mm -hmm. in high schools that, that actually see what's going on mm -hmm. and try to mitigate the problem. But the problem is huge. Oh, well, it's beyond an epidemic. And administrators don't even deal with it. They turn an eye on what's going on in school because it's everywhere. They're smoking outside of the locker room. They're smoking mm -hmm. in the bathrooms. And these kids see it. And the healthy kids see it. And what happens to them, you know? They well, they can get lost, they can they get can. pulled in, right. they can stay the course. Right. Here's the issue, you said healthy kids. So what makes a healthy kid? In my opinion, probably we share it. In right. my opinion, a healthy kid is a kid who's able to experience the fullness of themselves. Right. A healthy kid is a kid who is able to creatively think, who's <sighs> able to problem solve, who's able to emotionally regulate. A healthy kid is a kid who has creative interests outside of, let's say, their classes. And the kids that end up really struggling with addiction, really getting caught and pulled in, right. are these kids that are empty and that are very often disconnected from their own emotions. So in a lot from of themselves. Well, from themselves, because emotions carry, this is what I'm feeling. Right. This is the me of me, right. my feeling. By the way, talking about carried, many uh, folks carry, many people carry emotions from their abuser or, or their well, toxic talk about that. negative uh, parent. Mm -hmm. And that carried stuff we call carried shame, mm -hmm. literally. It's called carried mm -hmm. shame. And we take that because that's what we got from the people who didn't give us what we needed. And I so think instead that of love, they we have, get shame. They get shame. You know, we, it, let's say we have an angry mom right. whose mom her, herself was angry. Right. So this is the mother that ascribes incorrect notions about her child to the right. child. This child is crying to test me, right? right? So, or the mother that's so punishing of the child, just having a normal emotional experience of itself. Right. 
or a mother who starts to cut a child off when the child says I feel right. or I don't like the mother says you don't feel that right. that's not true right you know my, my I use the broccoli example which is you're at the dinner table and your kid goes I don't like broccoli and the mother goes yes you do but the good mother says right. oh okay well I won't serve it again do you want carrots or string beans I, I actually had an experience yesterday. I was doing some teletherapy uh, with a couple I treated here. Now they're in, in Texas. And the husband is constantly negating the wife's experience. God. And he learned that. Yeah. So when you negate somebody's experience, say, oh, you're not feeling that. No, you're not thinking that. That's not correct. What is the receiver supposed to get from that? Well, they start to disconnect. Well, they, they start, start to, to not trust. They, they don't trust themselves. Right. They don't trust the other. And they're going, well, maybe what I'm feeling is not what I'm feeling at all. Yes. So that's negation. They yes. negate their own experience mm -hmm. because it's being negated from the outside and reinforced that way. And that's not healthy either. And we see this in unhealthy bonding as well. When someone says, I'm experiencing this, it's kind of weird, mom or dad. Mom or dad, a good mom or dad's gonna say, well, let's just talk about it. It's not weird. It's just part of human experience because everything in human experience is wide open, right? That's very true. When we talk about, if we can go back for a minute to this notion of failure to launch, I have a client right now and I just met with her yesterday. Uh -huh. And so I wanna share a story, which is this client has failed to launch, repeatedly ending up back in her addiction. And when we start to open this experience up, gosh, how did this happen? Where did it start and why? The client had a very particular experience at the age of 14. At a family camp, this client got together with a boy and this client's mother caught them kissing and sort of you know, rubbing up against each other as right. typical 14 year olds might do at night on the tennis court or something. The mother lost her mind. She lost her stuff. And so here's the fact, the client's 14, the boy's 14 or 15. They're doing normal 14, 15 year old stuff. The families are there for a week. The parents are there. What is actually going to happen? Nothing really terrible. This is a nice girl. She kind of knows herself. But the mother lost her mind and spent the rest of the time chasing this girl around, trying to find her in bushes or around corners or in other kids' rooms. So. The family left the camp. There was a tremendous amount of shaming done to this girl. So as I was talking to her yesterday, she's almost 30 years old now, I said to her, and, and the client said, you know, it was, it was a lot for me at the time with this boy. It was really a little bit more than I was ready for. And I said, well, who did you have to talk to about that? Who was going to help you through it? You needed an older woman to go to in safety to be able to say, hey, I want to do kissing with this boy, but I don't want to do anything else. And I don't know how to name that. I don't know how to navigate that. And my client started to cry and she said, I wish that you were my mother. And I Aww. said, so this idea, I mean, that's what we do as therapists. I am the surrogate mother. I'm trying to do that kind of repair. Sure. So, you know, we both do that. So I said to the client, this is a job of a mother. You are supposed to have an attachment with your mother that is safe. And when a situation like this comes up in one's development, you need to be able to go to your mom and talk about it. And my client just kept crying and crying and she started to get, you know, really out of breath. And she said, I couldn't do that. I was so shamed and I have carried that shame with me. And I said, right. these are normal 14 year old things. This is normal. But There's not no for problem, her, but, not, but not for, for her. her. And so this transmission of parental shame that actually wasn't her shame at all, right. but it became her shame. She carried it all of those all years, 16 years of carried mm -hmm. shame. Yeah. And maybe even goes beyond that. So again, some of the adult behaviors that we might expect to see in people who are unable to form uh, secure and healthy attachments in childhood. Do you think we've, we've talked about it? Did you, you want to- Well, I want to talk a little bit more. Let's talk a little bit more. Just because we've touched on no frustration tolerance. Right. So low we, frustration, low or frustration, low or no, low, low or, or no, no frustration tolerance. So when we talk about road rage, you know, if we track it back, I'd be really interested to know, you know, the impulse of like bar fights, beating somebody up, right. road rage. All of, I was at Trader Joe's some years ago around Christmas time and the parking was very difficult in the right. parking lot. I saw two men both vying for a parking spot, get out of their cars and start a fist fight around Christmas in the parking lot of Trader Joe's. Right. 
Okay, so we see stuff like that. We see a lot of anger. We see not good problem-solving skills. It's interesting. I I, I do. A, I, I have a number of uh, people that I treat that have road rage, and several of them are police officers. And I have their wives in, and we're doing kind joint therapy. And the wife is telling me about her husband, the police officer, or the highway patrolman, you know, and he is a rager. He's a rageaholic. And when you listen to the internal dynamic, the internal self-talk of the uh, of the rager, the the road rager, you know what it is? Hmm. I have a right to have <coughs> that spot. I, who the hell do they think they are ahead of me? They're doing this on purpose. It's all of that paranoia, crazy stuff that comes out that somebody is doing something to them, mm -hmm. and they have to, and 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 they're vindictive, and they have to make it right. You know, that's really interesting. I used to work with gang boys in residential treatment. This is a number of years ago. Right. To a one, they took everything personally. Every, and everything. here's what it was. Here's the boys used to, I worked with these boys 14 to 18 years old. Right. They were too young to go to jail, right. but they had to go someplace. All of them had committed crimes because they all had to get jumped into these gangs. Right. So I really like that kind of population. I like it when it's a little bit more difficult and sort of unusual right. and kind right. of weird. I like that stuff. And so um, this one boy was talking about how somebody looked at him funny. And I said, what do you mean they looked at you funny? How do you know how they looked at you? Like, do you know them? He said, no, I don't know them, but I didn't like the way they looked at me. It was, they disrespected me. This notion of being disrespected was an anathema to me. I never right. heard of something like this before. As if Somebody that doesn't even know you right. is doing something to you. This sense of like, I have to take care of this because I can't tolerate the disrespect or these, some kind of personal affront right. which that is, isn't even true. Which is the foundation of bullying. This is the foundation of bullying. That they have a chip on their shoulder. They don't feel good about themselves. They're mind readers. They know what you're thinking. And what you're thinking is you know, you're going to disrespect them. So all of these folk, these individuals are mind readers and it's all toxic and negative stuff so, because they're, it's all a projection, yes, if completely. you will. Everything they do is a projection and it wastes so much energy that they could be doing other things or thinking about other things, more pleasurable things. But again, this is all part of that self-safety I talked about in my introduction, is that they never feel okay. And everything they do is about p protecting themselves. Uh, in, in relationships, uh, in relationship to driving on the road with other drivers, all of that. Mm -hmm. And they're the biggest violators. So can we talk about projection just to really kind of make it super clear for everybody? Sure. Let's talk about that. So my understanding of projection yeah. is for somebody to hold a narrative or some series of notions right. that actually have no basis in reality or maybe a very small basis in reality, right. but they've blossomed into some kind yeah. of crazy story. Right. And then they will take that story and place that story on you. So if people are projecting, they're actually projecting or placing all kinds of stories about the person that have no basis in reality. Right. And then they are relating to that person based on their projections. Absolutely. So it's as if, if we have, you know, like the Michelin man, he's kind of like big balloon. Sure. So if you can imagine two of those and we look two of those balloon men and layer after layer after layer after layer around them is a layer of protection another layer of protection, another layer of protection. By the time two people meet in this wounded place, right. they're meeting all the way out at the very, very end of the very, very last layer of their protection. Right. And projection is a part of protecting the self. Absolutely. It and so is. to even try to find the core, the authentic self in that construct, mm -hmm. We have to take off layer by layer by layer by layer by layer. That's psychotherapy. That's what I'm doing with that's, clients wounded in this way. That's what we do. So I think we've talked about, uh, we, we didn't talk about the monkey study and the understanding. And, and I think you um, wanted to talk about the monkey study. We can talk about it just really briefly because it's horrible. I don't know. A lot of people know briefly about it. There's a theorist, a researcher named Harlow a number of years ago. Yeah, I, I, he's in the uh, first chapter of my book. What did you say uh, about him? 
Why is he in that chapter? The rhesus monkeys yeah, and no, the bonding. Yeah, and but the, what did you say? You just used, you used the monkey well, study? Well, the monkey study is what we found with rhesus monkeys is, you know, if you've got a wire mother with a, a heater in her uh, and she's wrapped in terry cloth, then you have another wire monkey and these, these monkeys were raised, yes. uh, one group with the wire mother and the other uh, with, with the mother, wire mother wrapped it with a heater. Mm -hmm. and, the soft. And the, the healthy padded. monkeys, the monkeys that they saw that had healthy development and healthy and personal relationships had this, the, the soft, warm mother. And the ones that became isolates and couldn't relate to anyone or anything had just the wire, the plain wire mother. Mm -hmm. Now, what we got from this is also that these rhesus monkeys, what was more important for them in development was to have the warm mother even more important than nutrition. Well, that was the theory at the time. At the time. Right, so the theory at the time was, and this is what Harlow tried to either prove or disprove, there was an initial belief that bonding occurred with the person that provided the food. Right. And that's what this study was actually set up to either prove Absolutely. or disprove. That's correct. And so the wire uh, kind of armature, you right. know, like a like a mannequin, the wire mannequin is actually the mannequin that the monkeys got their food from. Right. But the padded mannequin was what the monkeys clung to. That's correct. For security, That's safety, correct. and regulation. Absolutely. And so what was then proved, supposedly, in this study, and there were three, as I understand it, there, there were three there things were, that were done there. Yeah. Monkeys were, one, isolated completely, right. which they could never recover from that. They could never socially bond or anything like that. And then monkeys were given just the wire and the food, and then monkeys were given the padded and the wire and the food. With the with the heater in the middle. Yeah, yeah. And the heater, it was the heater and the food. And then right. the other one was just right. Right, right, right. But anyway, that's yeah. So okay. know that study. So be a warm, <laughs> be a warm, be warm. And, and toasty mom, yeah. and, and the kid. You won't have to feed the kid as much. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. You know what, this is so interesting because like nourishment, I'm all about mother-child bonding, <laughs> nourishing the child through that eye gazing, through the literal transmission of love. Quick story, if I may. When my son was very young and I'd pack him lunch for school and every day he'd come home from school and I'd say, how are you? How was your day? Did you eat your lunch? And finally he said, why are you always asking me if I ate my lunch? And I said, because I love you and I make your lunch with love and if you eat the food that I made you with my love, it feels like you're actually able to metabolize how much I love you. And so I'm all about this notion of nourishing your child through the eye gazing. Right. And if you have a well-nourished child, it's true. You don't have to feed them as much. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's our I study. Did, I didn't expect to say that one. <laughs> That's the fish kettle Marty uh, study. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I mean, uh, so we've, have we talked about all of the adult behaviors we can expect to see with uh, broken uh, uh, bonds and attachment? I don't know if we have all. Well, uh, Is there anything else that you can come up with? My primary things that I've noticed are right. inability to problem solve, lack of capacity to tolerate frustration, right. and anger. And also this behavior that tracks back to childhood, this kind of like jet skiing across the surface, right. really the inability to stay with anything. Right. So it's taking in information in bites right. as opposed to actually taking in a larger piece of information and then synthesizing it and understanding it through your own experience. But that takes introspection. Mm -hmm. And self-awareness and, self mm -hmm. and, and a certain amount of self-like. That's Because also. you have to like what, what you're feeling inside and not re reject it or, or try to block it out or resent it. Well, you don't even have to like it. One of the things that I notice with people struggling with addiction is 2A1, they all say, well, you know, I haven't been able to think about that or feel that because it makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I've now named this the dreaded uncomfortable. I mean, so what? I feel uncomfortable some of the time. It's no big deal to me. Right. What's the problem? So you don't need to slam dope because you feel uncomfortable. Well, I think the real, again, back to the issue of the threshold, the Agreed. lower our threshold for, for tolerating frustration and... Uh, and uh, Feeling states, the affective states that are right, not great. Right, we have to kind of feel better about, good about ourselves, and we have to feel and really understand what this threshold is so that we can process better. And because I mm. think kids that don't have healthy bonding don't process well at all. And what they do process is I'm not good enough People hate me, I hate myself, and that whole litany of stuff that we've already talked mm -hmm. about. So, 
Reactive attachment disorder is when a child's uh, bonding experience with its caregiver's primary caregiver uh, is interrupted. And if it is not repaired, if this kind of an interruption is not repaired. And most aren't. Most aren't. Then we have a child who becomes quite disengaged and cannot bond. Cannot bond with other adults, cannot bond growing up and form uh, successful adult relationships. And I really wanted to get this in. Right. I actually have a reactive attachment disorder client at the moment. She's yeah. making my life miserable. Because she can't accept my love. She can't accept my acceptance. It doesn't feel safe. She doesn't trust it. Okay, so what's your therapeutic... Okay, so what is your process in treating this per? It's a she? Mm -hmm. And what is your process in, in treating her? What does your therapeutic outline look like? Gosh, what a good question. My therapeutic process with her is to simply allow her hold space and help her tolerate what she feels. That's it. That's what I'm doing. That's all you have to do. And you can spend a year, two years just doing yes, it's a getting long to that. It's a lot of processing. Yes. In wrapping this up, what do you <laughs> recommend for parents and, and of young children to do differently? And I know we've, throughout our interview today, been talking about that. But do you have any final words about what parents can do differently? Just be curious about your kid. Hang out with your kid. Be curious. Who is this little person? Right. Take joy in their joy. One of the things that I say all the time is a child who's not delighted in cannot delight in themselves. Delight in your children. And before you can do that, start delighting in yourself. I mean, why did you have kids in the first place? Absolutely. To delight in them. So I can remember feeding my son when he was three months old. His first uh, little food out of a you know, baby food instead of the bottle. And he was just sitting there looking at me and it was the very first time he took baby food and he was all a Twitter about it. And I just remember looking at him and I said to him, I delight in you. And I continue to this day. And so delight in your children and hang out with them and connect. And does he delight in himself? He does. Perfect. He's very cool, very hip. Sophia, we did it again. Good for us. Thank you <laughs> for being here. Thank you for the great information that you've provided my audience and my listeners and I want to thank you and I look forward to doing this again with you. Such a pleasure. Really a good time. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. So I'm Dr. Jerry Fishkin. I'm glad that you were able to join us on the show today. This was a really good one. I really, really enjoyed this. I want to just thank you again for being here and watching and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the Dr. Jerry Fishkin Show. So with all my love, and compassionate best, take care and we'll see you soon.